consider to you the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, St. John chapter 17. I want to tell you something about this chapter. It's a little, it's unique. Many people call Matthew, uh, in the book of Matthew is the Lord's Prayer, where they ask him, how do you pray? You say, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In other words, always pray to the Father. Now, when G this 17th chapter is Christ's prayer. This is where he is praying, and the mission is about accomplished. And I want you to note something about it. Unless he's quoting scripture, such as Psalms 22, he doesn't call our Father God. He calls him Father. Uh, because that was the office of Savior under uh, Yahweh, the Supreme. And, and uh, this particular chapter is the true Lord's Prayer. The one in Matthew, he's just telling you how to pray. Here, he's praying himself. Prayer is talking to the Father. And a lot of people say, well, how, how do I pray? Talk to him. I mean, be honest and tell it, have, show your feelings and what, what your problem really is. Just talk to him. You don't even have to say it out loud. But here we go, this being Christ's prayer. Chapter 17, the great book of St. John, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven. And he said, Father... The hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. In other words, the mission is accomplished. Uh, and um, glory, which is to say eternal life, was made sure, especially for God's elect and whomsoever would. Verse 2, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, he should be given eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. This is an interesting saying because God has given them to Christ. Yeah, God's elect, he did. He chose them before the foundations of this world. Why? Because they stood against Satan in the first earth age. They were not taken in by him. Therefore, God knew he could trust them that whatever, once they get the truth, they're not going to turn loose. They're going to hang in there. <clears throat> Verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Now, who, who, then what is the definition of Jesus Christ? Jesus is Yeshua. That is to say, Yahweh's Savior. <clears throat> and Christ is Christos, which is to say the Anointed One, Messiah. And um, his, his name, Christ's name, even the etymology of it is as rubbing with olive oil to anoint uh, the Anointed One. Verse 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And, and it was this living word, which was none other than the word of God, became flesh and walked among us, teaching and bringing forth the road, the path, the way to eternal life. And even in so doing, as it's written in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 13, 14, he came here to pay the price on the cross whereby he could destroy death, which is to say the devil, to bring peace ultimately at the end of the millennium to the whole world. <clears throat> Next verse, please. Verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I want you to absorb that real good. 
the glory I had with thee before the world was, before it was ever created, both this earth age and the first one. Why? Because, you know, there is so much in this, and if you're a student of the Word, you know that in Genesis chapter 1, almost every verse begins with and, the word and, A-N-D. That is a polysendentin in, in, um, in, in the manuscripts, meaning it says a great deal more than is written. That's all the word means. And what it means is, and then the Spirit, the Lord, moved upon the waters. The Holy Spirit moved upon this. The Holy Spirit, and every time it's mentioned. <clears throat> so he was definitely with him. The Spirit belonged, the Holy Spirit is from the Father and the Son. And if you've seen one, you've seen the other. Verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Again, this is, would be God's election, those that were not deceived. And he, he has given his name. What does that mean? Well, it's talking about the sacred name. It's talking about what, what, what did, when Moses was up on the mountain, was given the commandments, and he started down with them, and then he had an afterthought. He said, well, wait, wait, who am I going to say sent me? I've got to have some credentials here for a little authority. And, of course, God said, I am that I am. And, and this being Iya Asha Iya in the Hebrew tongue, which is the etymology of the four consonants, Y-H-V-H, that perform the sacred name, Yahweh, which is the supreme name with the consonants uh, provided for that statement, his name. And then the Savior's name, Yeshua, that's Yah's Savior. That was his office of salvation that brought salvation not to the elect necessarily, but it completed there, but to whomsoever will, to who, who some, whomsoever would believe upon him. And the word he brought, and the word that the election would repeat and bring forth to teach others. And um, the name was extremely important. You keep his word and you keep his name. Verse 7. Now, they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. They've seen the miracles. They, they observed me when I brought life back to Lazarus. They, they observed me when I took a man that was blind from birth, never happened before, and restored his sight. They know that came from you. It had to because man can't do it. And uh, it was a strong witness that our Father is real. Our Father is in control. And it is our duty and obligation in love to understand him and to serve him. Verse 8. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, they accepted it, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Because of the miracles, because of what he accomplished, and wh what a teacher of the word. You know, the, even the so-called scholars of that day were amazed when he was 12 years old. How, how did he learn all these things? He's never been in our school, and many, many later on concerning the disciples. How did they learn it? They learned it from the living word as he walked. And you can today also. That word is still there. The word, uh, remember the first verse of this great book of St. John, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning 
that's coming out the gate. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And listen carefully. The Word was God. It is his Word, his method of communication to let you know eternal life is right there for you. In a beautiful world, put back as it was before the destruction. No, nothing that offends. I mean, buttercups growing at the North Pole and fruit growing at the South Pole. The whole earth protected with the firmament again, <clears throat> where it produced well. That's, that's what the eternity is about. And that is heaven, because wherever God is, is where heaven is. And Roman, Revelation 21 makes it very clear. He's coming here to establish his heaven. <clears throat> right here on good old earth. Let's go with the next verse, 9. I pray for them. He's interceding here and documenting that he's praying to the Father. I pray not for the world but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. This world age and all the wickedness that's in it, I'm, I'm just let it go its way. But I do pray for the election that you have given me. Gave them to him before. This is why you can read in Ephes uh, um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, I chose you before the foundations of this world because you stood against Satan in the first earth age. Verse 10, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine. And I am, that's the sacred name, I am glorified in them. They brings that glory because he, can, he converted, he established that living word walked among us, and naturally, what is his is the Father's because they are one and the same. If you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. The Son was in the dimension that we see in the flesh. The Father was not. He is in the dimension in which we see in the spirit body, which is eternal, and so it shall be. <clears throat> Verse 11. And now I am, there's the sacred name again, I am no more in the world. But these are in the world, God's election are, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. And, and that is why God's election are so very close because they have that truth, and no, no one can take that away from them, regardless of what happens. Never let them see you sweat on your first cruise. Keep, it, keep your head above water, and know that Father's on the throne, and we've got the victory. And certainly, um, his name, his truth, and through that name, um, you're safe. Say fine, because you have eternal life. Uh, what, what a blessing that is. Talk about glory. We could even say the Shekinah glory. Shekinah being a Hebrew word that means God dwells there, because he will. Verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. None of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. This is a scripture that throws many people, because right away they say, well, that's Judas Iscariot. Sure enough, just old Judas saved everybody but him. You, you would be sadly mistaken. It's talking about the son of perdition. Perdition means... Um, to perish. And we're not talking about the flesh perishing. We're talking about the very soul itself perishes. And you can read who it actually is. There's no multiple choice. 
There is only one entity by name that has been promised to death of the soul to be turned to ashes from within, which is a Hebraism that means finality. It's over for him. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19, where he is known as the king of Tyrus, which means rock. Tyrus is rock in the Hebrew tongue, but not our rock. Our rock is Christ. Those that are deceived, their rock is Tyrus, Satan. He's already a dead man walking. Just hasn't been passed yet. And nor can it ever be. He cannot be saved. Christ himself admitting that in this particular verse. They do not wish to have him saved. He had every opportunity in the first earth age to overcome. You can rest assured our father is always fair. And he was fair to him when he rose in rank even to where he was the cherub that protecteth, the mercy seat. And, and no doubt was in good standing at that time. But he fell miserably. When pride came in himself, not only did he fall, but he drew a third of God's children away from God and had them worshiping him, which was his whole desire. And naturally, that's one thing God will not tolerate. So never let someone tell you that this um, son of perdition is Judas. Judas repented. And, and um, they said, well, but he hung himself. He had a lot of help hanging himself when you read Acts chapter 1, verse 18, because he was cut open from his Adam's apple below his navel till his insides fell out. Hanging yourself doesn't do that. They could not afford to have him walking. The Kenites could not have him walking free. Uh, uh, so they, they did him in. So, again, never. It's, it's extremely important that you know the son of perdition, who it is. Uh, really, if you just simply take the word perdition and check it out in the Greek tongue and the definition thereof, you will know it wasn't Judas. You'll know it can only be Satan and from Ezekiel 28. Verse 13, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And, and what a joy it is to know you have that eternal life. To know that even Satan gnawing on people, causing all kinds of trouble, twisting people's minds and, and with deception and lies, God's going to do him in. It's just a matter of time. He's going down. He hasn't got a prayer, nor does he deserve one. But that glory for us is eternal life when you choose the word, the truth. Verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. We're just passing through this place. Okay. Um, Christ was not of this world because he's of the heavenly age and, and, uh, and God's election likewise. They simply, but as long as we have work here, we must stay here and do God's bidding to save as many souls as can be saved by the word of God. Because that brings blessings um, to the lost. And if you truly are one of God's elect, it is your desire to plant those seeds and bring the lost to that beautiful truth whereby they also can have that eternal life. So when you're not of the world, then don't get too attached to it. It's a very passing thing. And quite frankly, though God created everything pre very good, it's much better where we're going to go. So at 15, 
I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. And, and do you trust that? He will. As long as you will use common sense, and as long as you are wiser than the serpent, but as peaceful as a dove, uh, and uh, th that's a scripture. A little old dove is very peaceful unless you start messing with her nest. Then it's a whole different story. But you have the power over that that is evil in the name of Christ. So don't put up with it. Don't let Satan eat at you or your family. In Christ's name, order him out. You don't have to put up with it. Verse 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. You, you were chosen in the first earth age. Re Ephesians 1, 4 again. I chose you before the foundations of this earth. You are here on a mission. And that mission is, is to serve the living God. And, and so it is. Uh, 17, sanctify. Sanctify means to set aside, a sent one, okay? Set aside them, though, through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And, and the truth does set you free. It sets you aside. It sanctifies you. It gets rid of the thoughts of this world to the point that you can look forward to better things. But better things in this world also, when you look at the positive, when you can see the hand of God working in this world, it makes you appreciate it a great deal more because he knows exactly what he's doing. And I guess I could say, do you? You do if you know the word pretty well. Verse 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Do, do, you know what, um, do you know what the word apostle is? It's a sent one. What he's doing here is calling you apostles, sent ones. Send you there to do your work, to assist, to help to be a part of that many-membered body that makes up the very tabernacle of God in these end times, the very many-membered body which has the power of God. They are not of this world, but, the, but they have duties here in this world, and they will straighten it out. We are of the third earth age and heaven age. And there is home, 19. And for, and for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified, that's set aside through the truth. That it, it sets them aside into a special category. Now, this, don't, don't let Satan's little prideful thing slip into your mind and your heart thinking you're something special. Be thankful that you are set aside. But God is not a respecter of persons, not even those he sets aside over any of his children that will believe. So uh, there's one mark of God's elect. They have compassion, and they care about the rest of the children. That's why God sent them, quite frankly. Verse 20, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. In other words, I pray for each one that they even reach with the word of God, with the truth, that they convert. And I, I, I pray for them also. So that's why it's a family. It's the many-membered family, body of Christ, and how precious it is when you see the depth in his prayer to Almighty God in this particular chapter. Verse 21, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, 
that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And again, that many-membered body made up. And, and how could they not believe that, the, that the God sent him? I mean, it was spoken of in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. It said a virgin is going to conceive. There is a male child going to be born. You're going to name him Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. We had every warning from the word when he would appear and basically whom he would appear to. And uh, certainly this all came to pass. And, and uh, putting together that many-membered body that brings in, no, he didn't leave anyone out. Think those that they can reach that will believe. We bless them. We set them aside. Sanctify them. Verse 22. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. That, that glory even goes to the Shekinah glory. When, when he promised us the comforter, back in the 14th chapter, and, and the comforter is here, that's the Holy Spirit, that when, when you do his work, when, when you have his will in mind, then that comforter is going to be with you and you become one with them because they abide or dwell. And remember the word mone in the Greek that I taught you in that 14th chapter? It means to be together, to abide, to live together, naturally in the many-membered body. And, and how precious that is that God gives you that glory. What Again, what is it that Shekinah means, Shekinah glory? It means God dwells there. Well, where is that? With us. In his spirit, the Holy Spirit. Verse 23. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect, that's mature, in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. That's the way our Father is. Our Father is a, is a Father of love. Do you understand? That's why he created your very soul. Soul being different than any soul that exists. I, I mean, your DNA is different. Your fingerprints are different. You're unique. He wanted someone just like you. But he wants you to love him because he's a father of love. He loves his children. When they obey him, and when they follow him, and when they return that love, because that's what he wants. I'm not going to say that he is lonely and desperate for love. He's loved by many, but he wants your love also documentation, as you've heard me say many times for that, is Hosea chapter 6, verse 6 in the Minor Prophets. I don't want your burnt offerings. I want your grace, your mercy, your love. That's what I want from you. That's what he wants you to sacrifice even in the millennium, not animals. Christ's blood was complete for one and all times as far as blood sacrifices go. Now he wants you to sacrifice your love for him. Verse 24. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me, where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Think about that. Don't let it slip by you before the foundation of the world. The, the, well, why would God, why, if they're one, one, he's the Savior. He's the one, he is the, that Godhead that came 
not to not to lord it over, but to bring salvation to whomsoever would. Even those that fell in the first earth age, those that fell miserably, with the one exception of the son of perdition, he sent that Savior, whereby believing upon him, accepting him, which when you accept him, what is he? He's the word of God. You automatically accept the word of God, meaning you accept our heavenly father. And how precious it is that his mode of salvation was with him, even from the beginning. Why? He knew he would need it because he knew his children. There's only one way you can have children love you that's if you give them free will. Because love that comes from any other way, by force or bought with money or ordered, is not love. It must, must be given and come from within each entity. Therefore, God must let each entity make his or her mind up. Are you going to love God, or are you going to love the world, or are you going to love the prince of the world? He gives you that choice. But in this prayer, he lets you know how special you are if you listen. How that he prays for you. That you would not be deceived. And this one, this plan, was placed in operation before the foundations of this world. Why? God loves you. And God very well understands the workings of the world and man. Does he want ultimately freely given from you, no force, nothing else, your love whereby he can bless you? All right, don't miss the next lecture. You listen a moment, won't you please? Verse 146, the first six chapters in God's word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular tapes. How was the what? How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you've always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. And there we are, back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. If you do that, uh, please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. It's not our right to judge. It is your right to discern what you should hear and not hear. But leave the judging to your father or he will be unhappy with you. Don't judge people. That's a sin. All right, those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you an amazing address. Again, it's a pleasure. Now, you've got a prayer request, you can do away with the number and the address. Why, God knows what you're thinking. I don't care where you are in this world. If you love him, let him know and receive his blessings. And petition, talk to him. That's what prayer is. Christ gave us a perfect example today of how to pray to our Father. So don't ever let that escape you. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Rose from Massachusetts. In the book of Revelation, what took place in that half hour of silence? Well, what, what happens in heaven that will cause it to be 
asylum, it would seem that our accuser is in heaven. You know, like, you take like Satan. If you want a good example of it, Job chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. So God asked Satan what he, where he'd been. been walking on the earth. God said, what do you think about my man Job? He's no good. You pull your wall down around him, I can have him eaten out of my hand. A minute. In other words, our adversary is in heaven. He's going to be tossed out. And he will be tossed out for one full hour, Revelation chapter 17. But half of that, he is out of heaven and, and preparing the earth for his takeover. And naturally, woe, woe, woe to those on earth. But you have that peace in heaven for that half hour period. Uh, Tawana from Arkansas, where is the Bat Creek Stone? The Bat Creek Stone is locked away in the Smithsonian Institute. And, uh, you know, we have many people that try to translate that stone. Yours truly, I think, is the, has translated it. And um, I remember as a young lad about 14 or 15 seeing a picture in a newspaper of that stone many, many years ago. Little did I know that I would be the one who would translate that stone. And, and there's a reason for it. You have to be familiar with the Masera. You have to be familiar with a true priest. You have to think like one. You've got to put yourself in his shoes to know and understand what is written, especially the Maseratic note. Without that note, you can't translate it. So it was a big blessing to me. And what did it say? It said, may the lion of the tribe of Judah be the poker that brings these ministers of fire back to our Heavenly Father. And it, it's a beautiful thought. Uh, Dorothy from Florida Okay, where is your question? My question is, if we don't go to church, have, how can we take part in Passover supper? I am so grateful for you and your staff. Here are my, and thank you. Keep up the great work. Uh, I watch you on channel 256. Well, good. It's good to have you with us. We will be taking the Lord's Supper on television. This is a church. When you listen to us, you're in church, teaching God's Word and only God's Word. And um, we will announce it well before that you will have the ingredients there and we will take it all together at uh, Passover time. <clears throat> and Sharon from Illinois. Um, I... I'll probably never hear your answer to this, but I was wondering, did you, let, let me see here, I've got to back up some. While on the treadmill, I've been watching a documentary about Harry Truman, and yet he mentioned the Chosan Reservoir and how he couldn't sleep thinking about the boys there. Then I remembered you said you had been there. I'll probably never hear this answer to this, but I was wondering, did you agree with Truman or MacArthur? Um, well, um, you know, MacArthur was a good general, but he received a lot of bad information from an under general that was on the field. What he did, what this under general did, is he kept pumping MacArthur that everything was clear the Marines and the Army were taking North, North Korea, and we were, we did. They were no match, it was a pushover. <clears throat> but then um, our General Smith in the United States Marine Corps kind of saved us because he knew those Chinese were coming in. I mean, it didn't take long when you do a little intelligence from ca prisoners. And, and um, he kept our lines protected where no one was cut off from supplies. 
But MacArthur was fed some bad information, and I'm not going to mention any name of any general. I know the name, but I'm not going to say it. He, he did not give MacArthur good information. Therefore, MacArthur could not protect us with bad information. But General Smith did, and um, we, we, many of us survived it. It was cold, and we had about um, 120,000 frontline troops of the Chinese with about 120,000 backup when there was only about uh, 14,000 of us. But uh, due to our, to, um, our military, our Air Force, our Navy fighters, uh, aviators, and Marine aviators, uh, I mean, those boys came in so close you could see their beards when they went by. And um, they, they kept us, we had artillery that we didn't have to carry on our backs. They spit it out on the ridges. So I, I have to respect both men, but um, uh, they, with what they had to work on, they certainly did a good job. MacArthur was extremely honored and respected by the Japanese people. Okay. He really did a lot for them, and it's too bad. He was a good general, and, uh, but uh, unfortunately, he was removed at a bad time because of bad information. Anthony from Philadelphia, how do I learn how to pray? I pray to talk to the Father. I don't think I know how to pray. All you got to do is talk to him. There, there's one thing you must remember. You got to be honest. You, you can't con God. He knows what you're thinking. So when you talk to him, that is prayer. Get off to yourself if you must. Uh, however, you don't even have to say it out loud. He hears you. But the main thing is be honest. And if you for one moment say, well, I don't think he hears me, then you might as well stop praying because you've questioned him. He does not like to be questioned. That is to say, he gives you faith, and either you have faith or you don't. And faith gets prayers answered. When you have the faith to know he hears you, and if you love him, whatever he decides, he will give it to you one way or the other. And whichever way he gives it to you will be for your benefit. It may not be the way you want, but he knows what tomorrow brings and he's going to protect you in that wise. You have to have the faith and the trust to know that. That's why you always pray in his will, if it be your will. Brenda from Indiana. My question is, if Satan is Antichrist, then is someone else fulfilling the office of the one world system and the political system? Well, of course. When, like in, in the book of Revelation, when you have this multi-headed monster. God doesn't deal with monsters. Those are multi-headed governments. In other words, there are government systems. The deadly wound is not received by the Antichrist or any single individual. The deadly wound is received to the one world peace system. But in verse 4 of Revelation 13, on cue, Antichrist shows up as the old dragon and brings peace to the world and everybody is happy thinking it is Christ except those that God's elect have reached and Christ has reached to know he's a fraud. Uh, Ron from California, what does I-N-R-I mean? Um, it, it is the lettering that was placed over the cross that Jesus was crucified on. And I is Jesus, N is from Nazareth, R is Rex, which means king, and I of Israel, Jesus Christ from Nazareth, the king of Israel. 
uh, Bill from Louisiana. How did Cain marry? Who, who did Cain marry? Where did these people come from? Six-day creation. You have to be familiar with the six-day creation or the Bible doesn't make any sense. Okay. And, and the Bible makes lots of sense if you'll read it properly. On, on the sixth day, God created all the races. And he looked and it was good. He loved the races. Made hunters out of some, made fishers out of some. Uh, some grow their wheat in the soil and some grow them in water because they're of the water. And, and uh, then he wanted a husbandman, a farmer. And he created Ethadam. That's a different person. And uh, through that, him and Eve would come Christ, the Savior of the world. God's plan, his plan coming out the gate. Um, I, I know that's not taught normally, but it is the simple truth from the manuscript, from God's Word. And anyone that cares to make a deeper study of it, order the DVDs. I'm going to say it again, DVDs, because in that DVD of the first six chapters of Genesis, I teach you how to read the Hebrew and the difference in the structure of mankind. Elizabeth from California, are we supposed to help our children that are grown with rent and clothes and food until they find a job? Well, uh, you know, if you if it is, is at all possible, naturally it's human nature that you would. Now, this is if it's actually going to assist them to sustain themselves and if they are looking for a job. Okay. Now, if they're just holed up and they're not even trying, I, I would have to give that a little thought. And especially if drugs enter into it, then you become an enabler. You would have to stop. That's a sin. Now, I always like for one, if they feel they're being taken advantage of, is to read 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning with about verse 8. And if you have a loved one that will not work, don't feed them. This is God's way of saying, if you won't feed them, there's a little micro switch between the belly button and the backbone. And when they get pretty close together, the word work just comes out and they'll, they will go to work. They'll find a job. <clears throat> That's if they won't look, if they won't try. Uh, Pat from then read uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6 forward. Pat from Missouri. Where is it in the Bible where Jesus tells the Kenites they are sons of Cain? Well, he, he tells them in the same book we're studying today, St. John, in chapter 8. In verse 44, he tells them, um, you know, he said, my people listen to what I say, but you don't listen. Why? Because you, your father was the first murderer. Duh. Now let me think. Who was the first murderer? Well, it was Cain, of course. And then he continues on to say, my children hear my voice, you don't. Because you're not my children, you are the children of the devil. Uh, you'll find that after verse 44 of chapter 8, this great book of, uh, of John. You can also go to Matthew chapter 13, and from verse 35, kept secret from the foundations of the earth, the seed that Satan planted in the garden, the wicked seed, the children of Satan, the Kenites. Glenn from uh, Arkansas, was Judas Iscariot a Kenite? Well, it's, it's very possible that he was, but, but I want to make something very clear. A Kenite, if they accept Messiah, Jesus Christ, the true Christ, they're no longer a child of the devil. They're no longer a follower of him. If they love the Lord, salvation is available for them. 
This is why you never want to judge someone. I have, um, I have observed the word of God, when taught properly, convert a Kenite. It was a beautiful, wonderful thing. But uh, then that's, you know, our Father has a way of taking the Word and using it and using people even to make wonderful things happen. So be cautious how you judge. That's all I'm saying. Becky from Arkansas, can you please explain Acts chapter 17, verse 20? That was a very interesting happening. Paul had gone to Mars Hill. And on Mars Hill, it's where a bunch of people met and just ratchet jawed. No, wanted something new. Didn't go with the old. Wanted a new religion every day. The more you could dream up, all the better. They even had one slogan there, to the unknown God. And Paul would tell them, I'm going to tell you who I teach. It's the one you call the unknown God because you don't know him. And, uh, and he taught them. It was happened at Mars Hill. What it, what it um, meant is they wanted some strange thing to be taught. And he taught them the word of God, only as Paul could. Becky from Arkansas. In, that, in Daniel chapter 1, verse 12, what is pulse? Pulse... The Hebrew word is uh, something sown. Now, what, what does that mean? And if it's something sown, it's vegetable. It's growing food from the earth. It's not meat, okay? So the, the, he was fed grain or vegetables. Something sown is what the word means in the Hebrew tongue. Karen from Texas. Why does the Bible not refer to God by his name, Yahweh? Well, because of the English translations and other translations, then uh, certainly I, I want to correct you, though. The Hebrew manuscripts and the Aramaic manuscripts call him by his real name. So the Bible, the manuscripts do call our Heavenly Father, Yahweh, and uh, in many more places than one. But then when you translate it to another language, they translate it to that language like Yeshua, which is Yahweh's Savior, is translated to read Jesus. It means the same thing, but it's a different language. Then what does a teacher do? A teacher that is wise uses all names but points out the sacred name. And people that are supposed to know better grow with it. And uh, all is well that uh, begins well and ends well. Kathy from Illinois, are we in the sixth seal? No, we're not, but we're knocking on the, on the door very, very close to the beginning of it. But there's things, many things must happen even in the sixth seal. George from North Carolina, where do you find in the Bible that we have two bodies? Well, that's, that's real simple and very beautiful. It's um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, begin reading with about verse 35. And Paul, through the, the Father through Paul tells you that when, when you die, it's kind of like a, a corn seed, kernel. You put that kernel in the soil, and it dies. It rots. Why? Because it feeds the embryo that God has placed in that kernel, and it grows into a new plant. And then he tells you, you have two bodies. And when this flesh body dies, you have this beautiful spiritual body that springs forth. And naturally, it was the corn was a lot prettier than the old kernel, and so it is that our spiritual bodies, which never age, you never look old or anything in a spiritual body. 
and um, and you never get ill. You never, it doesn't wither. It doesn't get old. And um, that, that's where you have two bodies, celestial and terrestrial, flesh and spirit. Read it for yourself the remainder of the chapter. Martha from Mississippi. Is there any place in the Bible that says if you have a beard that you cannot be a preacher? Uh, no, it doesn't say that you, if, if you have a beard. Now, if you were going to take the vow of a Nazarite, then that might apply. But you don't find too many preachers today that take the vow of a Nazarite, so they don't have to worry about it. But there's nothing wrong with a minister having a beard. I certainly prefer not to, but there's nothing, nothing biblically wrong with it, and I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But you know what? Most of all, God loves you for it because it's the letter he has sent to you telling you his emotions, how he feels, and what his plans are. And when you read that letter from him, it makes his day. When you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. We, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, listen to me and listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray.
Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Another addition to the law lecture, lecture on law. We just thank our Father for the privilege of his word, which most of it is law, his plan, so to speak. What does law mean? Well, if you really take the Hebrew and break it down to the prime, to point out, to point out what? Well, to point out the proper course that most people should take. And I thank our Father for the privilege that we have of dealing with this subject. And we ask a word of wisdom in the name of Yeshua Messiah. Amen. In discussing the law, 